On this Thursday night, likes, hashtags, and lawsuits. Why four Ontario school boards are suing three social media giants. They're using our kids like little piggy banks. 25 years for a fallen crypto king. Why a judge called Sam Bankman freed a remorseless scammer. Keeping up with the times. We never had a negative leap second. Why Earth's rotation is slowing slightly and what it means for timekeepers. And an ultra marathoner's ultimate feat. It's as terrifying as you can picture it in your head. The first Canadian to win a race as notorious as it is impossible. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Four Ontario school boards are taking on social media platforms, suing Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Snapchat, claiming they've been negligently designed for compulsive use and have rewired the way children think, behave and learn. The school boards are seeking $4.5 billion in damages, alleging the companies employed exploitative business practices designed to maximize profit at the expense of student well-being. That, they say, has drained school resources and personnel, leaving educators to manage the fallout from students' compulsive use of the apps. This is not a first. There are similar lawsuits underway in the U.S. Abigail Beeman has our top story on why Ontario school boards are adding to the pressure on social media companies. What do you like on YouTube? Usually videos of people just going around doing random things like testing illegal items. Kids and social media, it's on most parents' minds. I don't see why they need to be in class checking their Facebook page. Do some math. There's another component of it which has to do with just talking to your kids about dangers and sort of about what the perils of it are. Four Ontario school boards, three in the Toronto area and one in Ottawa, have teamed up to take social media giants to court. We're seeing the dysregulation in classrooms in terms of anxiety, mental health concerns, uh, aggressive, rise in aggressive behaviors. They're asking for four and a half billion dollars. It's a measure of the level of harm that's occurring and the amount of resources that the schools have identified are going to be necessary. The boards point to a 2021 survey that found 91 percent of Ontario students in grades 7 to 12 use social media daily and nearly a third of them use social media for more than five hours every day. Let's be honest here. They are promoting to children. Because each child, their lifetime value, meta calculated, is $270 to them, 270 US dollars. And that's what they're doing. They're using our kids like little pity piggy banks while running unsanctioned, non scientific experiments on their psychology. None of the allegations has been proven in court, and the social media giants aren't saying much. Snapchat says it's different from traditional social media with no feed, public likes or comments. TikTok says it has industry leading safeguards and continually evaluates emerging practices and insights to support teens well-being. Meta didn't respond to a global news request at all. What are they spending on lawyer fees to go after these massive companies that have endless cash to uh, fight this? So let's focus on the kids, not about this other uh, nonsense that they're they're looking to fight in, in court. The board say they'll only pay lawsuit costs if they win. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is promising more help to expand child care options in another pre-budget announcement. He says $60 million will go to non-repayable grants for eligible child care centres to build new spaces or renovate and will offer student loan forgiveness for rural and remote early childhood educators. Now we knew that access to affordable, high-quality child care was important right across the country. Families, particularly moms, shouldn't have to choose between a career and raising a family. The Prime Minister says the upcoming budget will include more than $1 billion in initiatives to expand affordable child care in Canada. The goal is to create 250,000 new child care spaces by March of 2026. In New York, a young man who enticed celebrities, politicians and business people to trust them with billions of dollars of their cash has been sentenced to 25 years in prison. It is a spectacular downfall for 32-year-old Sam Bankman-Fried, whose cryptocurrency exchange FTX collapsed. Today, the U.S. Attorney General said the sentence should serve as a warning to anyone who thinks they can hide their financial crimes behind wealth and power. 
Our senior business correspondent, Anne Gaviola, is with me from Toronto. And his lawyers hope for six and a half years. He got 25. In terms of white-collar crime, how significant is that? Well, prosecutors call this one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. And part of Judge Lewis Kaplan's rationale for that 25-year sentence is that, in his view, there's a risk this man will be in a position to do something bad in the future. And there's a financial penalty here, too. Bankman Freed was also ordered to pay $11 billion in forfeiture at his sentencing. This case is like something out of a movie, with Bankman Freed who's known as SBF, is the main character. There's that meteoric rise to fame and riches in a relatively short amount of time. This is a man who graced the cover of Forbes as the world's richest 29-year-old, a proponent of what he called effective altruism. That was his philosophy to make as much money as possible so you can, in his words, do as much good with it as possible. SBF was also a notable political donor, mostly to the Democrats. Prosecutors say he used money stolen from FTX customers to make more than $100 million in political campaign contributions before the 2022 U.S. midterm elections. And, and the judge blasted him for a lot of things today, but one thing for claiming investors had zero losses when FTX collapsed. What's the real story? Yeah, Bankman Freed apologized in court today, saying he made, quote, selfish decisions that haunt him every day. Yet, in his trial testimony, he claimed customers didn't actually lose money. That is a claim that the judge refuted. And he accused SBF of showing no remorse and lying during trial testimony. Have a listen to what one reporter in that Manhattan courtroom had to say about SBF. The prosecution was able to show multiple times where Sam had the opportunity to do the right thing, to come clean, and he chose not, not to do so, going all the way back to 2021. Yeah, and remember, the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan invested in FTX in 2021, and the following year, it was forced to write off its $100 million investment after the cryptocurrency exchanges collapse. Donna? All right, and Gaviola in Toronto, thanks. In Ottawa, the inquiry into foreign interference zeroed in on the nomination process of political candidates. The head of Elections Canada said there are few rules that govern how parties select candidates in individual ridings. And the inquiry heard of at least one case where foreign actors took advantage of that lack of oversight. David Aiken is following the proceedings. David. Well, Donna, there's lots of rules about elections in Canada, but party nomination contests, those fall almost entirely outside of election law beyond uh, 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 some restrictions around uh, the financing, we have no rules and there are no rules in the act regarding the manner in which and who participates in nomination contests. Canada's chief electoral officer, Stéphane Perrault, said there is little his office or any authority could do about problems with nomination races. And as other witnesses testified, that makes them vulnerable to foreign influence. It's very easy to manipulate. It's very easy to mobilize. It's very easy to give cash to candidates. There's very little oversight on how nominations are done in this country. Perot testified he was told by CSIS that foreign interference could have occurred in a nomination contest in 2019 in the Toronto area riding of Don Valley North. But for legal reasons, Perot could not say which party it involved. I'm not authorized to speak beyond what is in this public statement. But Global News reported last year that national security sources were convinced it was the liberal nomination race in 2019 and that state actors from China were involved. That nomination was won by Han Dong, who became the MP and now sits as an independent. Dong has rejected any allegations the Chinese helped him. He was not at Thursday's hearing, but his lawyer was, and his lawyer had no questions for Perot. Justin Trudeau, the Liberal leader, was asked about Perot's testimony, but avoided speaking specifically about the nomination race. We can reassure Canadians that the integrity of our elections was not compromised, despite attempts. Senior officials from all three major parties will be on the stand next week at this inquiry, and they will almost certainly be asked about subjecting their nomination contests to more oversight and more public scrutiny. Donna? 
All right, David in Ottawa, thank you. There's more pressure on Israel tonight to take action to stop the spread of famine and starvation in Gaza. The International Court of Justice ordered Israel to ensure basic food supplies get into Gaza unimpeded and without delay. UN's top human rights official has already said Israel may be committing a war crime by obstructing aid. Israel denies that and has so far ignored demands from the UN and from the US to protect civilians. Crystal Gamansing reports on the signs of famine setting in and warning some of the images are disturbing. This tiny patient is two months old. The nurse helping her says she weighs less than five pounds. Throughout my work in this department in a northern Gaza hospital, we got used to receiving such cases in large numbers every day. We don't know how many children there are like this one. We do know aid groups such as the UN's World Food Program have spent months warning of a spiraling crisis. We desperately need the conditions to get access every day to be flooding this area with food assistance. The International Court of Justice issued an updated order to Israel Thursday, calling on it to fully cooperate with the UN without delay to allow for basic services and humanitarian assistance to get to those in need and for more land crossings to be used to access Gaza. I've met so many people who are angry and tired and despairing because their children go to sleep every night hungry. Israel says it does not prevent aid from entering Gaza and emphasizes its military actions are in self-defense, striking what it calls terror cells in Lebanon in an exchange of attacks with the militant group Hezbollah, while air and ground operations against Hamas in Gaza are relentless. We have to win. There is no substitute for victory. Victory at all costs is straining relations between Israel and the U.S. America has warned against large ground operations in Rafah and has repeatedly urged Israel to do more to protect civilians and ensure they have access to needed humanitarian supplies. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. A timeline of Tuesday's bridge collapse in Baltimore. Coming up, what happened on the ship seconds before the collision? The U.S. Navy and the Coast Guard have begun the difficult task of clearing the remnants of that collapsed bridge in Baltimore. A barge and a crane are on their way. Maryland is getting $60 million in federal relief to help with the cleanup and rebuilding. And families of the workers who died are looking for answers. Joel Senek is near the site tonight. Joel. On the river behind me, crews are working throughout the day and into the night around and on the vessel as they work to prepare to get the ship and the bridge debris out of the water. New video shows the mere seconds before the fatal collision early Tuesday morning. The site now a salvage operation. This work is not going to take days. This work is not going to take weeks. We have a very long road ahead of us. The difficult task paling in comparison to the pain felt by the victims' families, all from Mexico and Central America. Six construction workers on the bridge when it collapsed lost their lives, including Minar Yasir Suazo Sandoval. His brother in Honduras calling him a pillar and bastion of their family now lost. The U.S. Coast Guard says the ship underwent routine engine maintenance in Baltimore before setting sail. Still, one expert says he doesn't see any major red flags. You have to target where you're going to do your inspections. And this ship, you know, looking at its inspection history, was really good. It really was. Audio from the ship's data recorder is allowing investigators to lay out a timeline leading up to the collision. Officials say the ship left the terminal at 12.39 Tuesday morning. At 1.25, a number of alarms went off. About a minute and a half later, a call was made for tugboats in the area to assist. Then the anchor was ordered to be dropped. 20 seconds later, the pilot reported the ship had lost power, alerting police. Their duty officer radioed two of their units that were already on scene due to construction on the bridge. One on each side of the bridge. 
and ordered them to close traffic on the bridge. At 1.29 and 39 seconds, the pilot reported the bridge was down. Investigators pouring through the data as critical questions linger. You know, what we don't know is what caused the power outage. Was it a bad fuel? Was it a clogged water intake? Or was it electrical that caused this, the systems to trip and overload? Investigators on the river behind me say they are still in their gathering phase and will not be releasing any recommendations or conclusions until that is complete. Donna? All right, Joel Senek near Baltimore, thanks. There's been a terrible bus crash in South Africa. 45 people have been killed. It happened in the northern province of Limpopo. The Transportation Ministry says the driver lost control. The bus plunged off of a bridge into a ravine and burst into flames. The passengers were traveling to an Easter service in Botswana. The only survivor is said to be an eight-year-old child. One second to spare ahead why scientists may need to skip a second to keep time with the Earth. One second feels like nothing, but for the world's timekeepers, every single second matters. By precisely tracking the spinning of the Earth, they've discovered something unusual. We may have to lose a second. In the past, leap seconds have jumped us forward. As Eric Sorensen reports, this first leap backwards is linked to climate change. Climate change is warming the planet and melting the polar ice caps. And scientists have discovered that that is slowing down the planet's rotation ever so slightly. Like a figure skater, when the arms and weight extend outward, she slows down. So too when there's more water around the Earth's midsection. Greenland is dumping billions of tons of ice into the sea. And so the effect of global warming has been to slow the rotation of the entire Earth. It counters the recent trend of adding leap seconds every few years. This year, the planet is getting more than it bargained for, one extra second. For decades, movement in the Earth's molten core was speeding up the Earth's rotation. It's one reason we've added leap seconds. We've paused the world's clocks for one second to keep in sync with the Earth's rotation. We've actually added 27 leap seconds since 1972. But as the ice caps melt and more water shifts to the equator, slowing the Earth, we haven't added a leap second in eight years. And scientists now expect to subtract a second. In other words, clocks would jump ahead one second to shorten the day. A negative leap second, they're calling it. Why does it matter? We deal in nanoseconds here. Those are billionths of seconds. They keep track of time very precisely at this lab near Denver. Adding or subtracting a full second is a big deal in an interconnected computerized world. Your phone, GPS. GPS works by having atomic clocks on board satellites. Yeah, imagine something like the stock market, right? You have hundreds of millions of transactions happening in a second. Our technology and our clocks have been able to adjust to leap seconds, but a negative leap second? There would have to be lots of simulation studies done, software tested, uh, to make sure when that negative leap second is, is added that nothing breaks. Duncan Agnew expects the world's clocks may require a negative leap second as early as 2026. It's very hard to get all the computers in the world to, to know about this at the right time. Since it's never been done in the other direction, people are quite concerned that things won't be synchronized. As for the Earth continuing to shift its mass, it's like humans. Seems we slow down when we <clears throat> put on some weight around the equator. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. King Charles did not appear in person today at a traditional Thursday church service before Easter. He is undergoing cancer treatment. He did send an audio message stressing the importance of kindness and friendship. We need and benefit greatly from those who extend the hand of friendship to us, especially in a time of need. Queen Camilla was at the church service handing out special coins to 75 men and women who help their communities. King Charles is 75 years old. He is expected to attend the Easter service at Windsor Castle this Sunday. Race for the record books next. Two firsts at the world's toughest ultra marathon, including a Canadian win. Unless you're an ultra marathoner, it's hard to understand why anyone would subject themselves to the grueling ordeal. And those who take on the Barkley marathons, well, that takes a special kind of resilience. It's 160 kilometers of rugged terrain and must be finished in under 60 hours. Most competitors don't make it. Among the five runners who did cross the finish line this year was the first Canadian. Neetu Garcha explains how and why he did it. 
In the ultimate test of human endurance in the rugged terrain of Tennessee's Frozen Head State Park, Ukrainian-Canadian Ihor Varis made ultra-running history. Varis conquered the Barkley Marathons, often dubbed the world's toughest race, with a remarkable time of 58 hours, 44 minutes and 59 seconds. Congratulations. Back home with friends and community sponsors in Chilliwack, BC, the 29-year-old is still processing the reality. Probably will take years to sink in. It's, I still can't uh, wrap my head around it. First Canadian to finish it and then win it. Is, is just like, it, it's exceptional. Among the record five finishers is Tennessee's John Kelly with his third completion. There's a lot of value in, in placing ourselves in, in uncomfortable positions. But it was British runner Jasmine Paris who captivated hearts by becoming the first woman to conquer the race. I, I, I was just telling all. myself, so, if, went, uh, so if there's, you don't there's finish there's it now, you'll have to do it again. Three, <laughs> Touching the gate and collapsing in exhaustion, Paris balances elite running with motherhood and veterinary work. The race has controversial origins. It was inspired by the prison break of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassin and is shrouded in mystery, challenging participants to endure five laps of a 20-mile course. That's just over 32 kilometers, with nothing more than a map and a compass. Along the way, they have to find books with pages matching their bib numbers. You're climbing up and down Everest twice. My uh, legs were so cut up that I had blood rushing into my shoes. You don't just love it, you got to be really obsessed with it. And I feel like that's where I am at. Varys proving to himself even the most daunting challenges can be conquered with unwavering determination and belief in oneself. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Here's another example of resilience. Jacob Wasserman was one of the survivors of the 2018 Humboldt bus crash. It left him paralyzed from the waist down. He initially took up sledge hockey and then in 2022 moved to men's singles rowing. He quickly moved up Team Canada's ranks and won silver at a Paralympic Games qualifier in Brazil. That qualifies him for the Paralympics in Paris. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.